So I know I'm the last one uh, between you and the coffee break, and I'll move somewhat quickly because I have to provide a sort of an overview of the site before we get into some of the visual analytics. Um, and I think this is um, nice to follow on uh, uh, Haley and Sarah, um, a somewhat similar topic, and uh, I should probably, in full disclosure, mention that I am not a bioarchaeologist. I'm more of a geoarchaeologist with a background in site formation in the cave context, and so much of the work done here on the taphonomic side has been done by Jim Chatters, our bioarchaeologist, and Blaine Schubert, our, who's an expert on uh, place, uh, Ice Age uh, uh, megafauna, um, or I should say cave fauna in general, so as a paleontologist. So I'll, I'll move through our site here to a somewhat provocative photograph, but it'll all make sense when I provide an overview of the site. We're going to be talking about Oya Negro. It's a submerged cave site um, in Quintana Roo, Mexico. It um, was discovered uh, by Beto Nava and Alejandro Alvarez and Franco Tellini in 2007. It is now a project of the Subdirección de Arqueología Subacuática of the National Institute of Anthropology and History in Mexico. Um, so I'm here presenting on behalf of my colleagues both uh, in Mexico and the United States and Canada as well at McMaster University. So uh, this gives you a kind of an overview of, of where Oyo Negro as a large collapsed pit is located within um, Outland Cave is also part of the Sakaktun Cave system. So we see Oyo Negro as a as a pit uh, with a number of submerged uh, river passageways. This is all underground, leading to this pit. So uh, in prehistory, the access for both um, animals and humans into the cave system would have been at Viacan Oasis and uh, La Concha. Um, some of the entrances is up to a kilometer uh, from the pit itself, um, requiring animals and humans to make that passage. Um, uh, uh, through the caves that are now flooded. So, um, you know, as you know, uh, at the end of the last glacial maximum, sea levels were up to 100 meters lower than they are today. These upper cave passages were dry. So animals and humans making their way through the cave, ultimately to the end of a precipice, and some losing their footing, no doubt, and winding up in this death trap um, deep inside this cave system. So what we're looking at today is, if you're familiar with this, with the site of La Brea or La Brea tar pits, it's somewhat like La Brea tar pits, but without the tar. So, um, so this is just giving you a sense of, uh, of the passageway leading to the pit at Oyo Negro, which is now traversed um, by underwater cave explorers working on our project. So as you look at a few of these photographs, you just imagine both people and animals, um, even large extinct proboscideans, making their way through these passageways ultimately to arrive at the edge of this precipice over which um, many of them fell, only to be found by um, the underwater cave explorers that we're working with today in Mexico. So this gives you a sense of the size, the dimensions of the pit. You see the two divers painting their light sort of illuminates the, um, the pit itself. Um, you can see at the top kind of those precipices, the upper, leading to the upper passageways. Uh, the pit is about 65, or on average of 65 meters in diameter. Um, we're working at about 45 meters um, of water, and that leads, that's the sort of average depth of the majority of the deposits in Oya Negro, um, but uh, points in excess of 50, 55 meters. Um, and it's a, a pretty significant drop of about 33 meters from the upper passageway to the bottom of the pit. So we have a, a diverse assemblage of Ice Age fauna in the caves. Um, so of all of the animals that, uh, that we know about for the Ice Age in Mexico, these are represented in Oya Negro, so um, we're very excited to have uh, such a diverse assemblage, but also such excellent preservation and uh, impressive completeness of the skeletons. And some of the skeletons found in Oya Negro are the most complete of their genus or species anywhere in the Americas, so um, quite fortuitous. Uh, uh, this is the, give you a sense of, of the, the nature of these deposits, beautifully preserved and resting on the floor of the cave. Um, you see the pelvis and the femur of, of a gompithier, an extinct proboscidean. Um, we have cave bear, uh, Tremarctine bears, um, or short-faced bears. Uh, this is a Smilodon and a peccary, a uh, cougar, an extant species. Um, and uh, a number of ground sloths, both Shasta ground sloth and a new species of ground sloth, a new genus and species we're calling, uh, we just published as Noho Chichak, um, which was pretty exciting to have a, a new genus of ground sloth present in the cave. It's a megalonychid ground sloth. Um, perhaps the most interesting to us, <laughs> as archaeologists, um, was the relatively complete skeleton of a young woman found in the cave. Um, so as, as some of you probably know, we only have five partial skeletons that date to 12,000 years or older in the Western Hemisphere. Um, only two of those five, uh, for which we have 
Crania and Tacrania. So any discovery of a late Pleistocene individual is significant, Paleo-American, very, very significant. And our young woman here, um, I won't go into the details, um, we can see uh, her cranium uh, sort of maxilla up pinned against one of her humeri. And, um, but we'll kind of talk about and show what we've been doing in order to better understand um, the positioning of, of her skeleton at the bottom of the pit. So just very briefly, um, she's about 13,800 BP. Um, it's a calibrated AMS date. Also, we did indirect rate dating using uranium thorium on the calcite florets growing on her skeleton. Um, she's the oldest, securely dated, most complete um, skeleton yet found in the Americas. Um, and she's not necessarily important because she's that old. It's just sort of an interesting thing to note. Um, it goes to sort of speaks to the rarity of these um, of these specimens in the Americas. So um, we did get her DNA. There's a whole sort of mystery here that we won't go into. Um, she is mitochondrial uh, subhaplet group D1. She's one of the uh, founding five. Um, D, this is a Beringian derived um, haplogroup group and clearly uh, has ancestry to those individuals um, who were parked in Beringia prior to crossing into the Americas. So one of the big challenges for Rio Negro, of course, it's completely dark. Um, and we have um, uh, sort of bottom time constraints that are typical of working in in deep water. Um, there are a tremendous number of deposits at the bottom of the cave, and we've had, obviously, uh, the challenge of trying to document all of those um, in a way that brings the site topside to the paleontologist and anthropologist, geologist, archaeologist who uh, are very interested in better understanding how this site formed, transformed over millennia. So the, the scientists, are, by and large, are not diving to the site, so we need to bring that site topside to provide access virtually. So the initial focus was um, on, uh, on getting some, uh, some, of the, some images of the site itself, doing spherical gigapixel imaging, which was moderately successful. The focus then was obviously on the human remains. So we um, did in situ uh, photogrammetry of Naya's cranium um, and were able to do some of the sort of get, get an overall sense of her cranial facial morphology. Um, I won't go into the details here, but uh, the, not surprisingly, the, the initial focus was on, on the human remains. And, um, and so we were able to do that exclusively by using photogrammetric techniques at the bottom of the pit. She's since been recovered because of uh, the site um, being visited by unauthorized divers who uh, significantly damaged the site. Um, so we've had to do a full recovery of Naya's skeleton as well as um, uh, those of some of, the, some of the fauna at the pit as well. So um, sorry, very real challenges here. So um, I want to uh, kind of quickly look at one of the, one area of the cave. So this is the upper half of uh, the young woman's skeleton. Um, you can see the substrate's very complex, this relin cairn. So many of the, the bones have dropped down in between um, the, the, this, the, this area, this complex substrate at the bottom of the pit. You can see there her humerus, a radius and ulna. There's another humerus behind it. Um, and so what we're able to do with this uh, point-based visual analytics engine is to select these points and to, uh, in this case, after they're marked, we can select them, remove the substrate, and look at the nature of articulation or disarticulation um, without having the substrate um, interfere with our ability to view the site and, and assess the deposit itself. So we'll show, show some point marking here, looking at the bones, kind of getting a sense of what's going on. Um, and I should mention, you know, while this sort of video is playing, is that it's very important to us is that um, our real goal here is sort of look beyond models as static illustrations. I mean, it's how I'm accustomed to using them as well, and more towards the use of uh, interactive digital surrogates, right? So um, we want to take a multi-resolution, multi-scalar approach, and we're going to do this via a point-based visual analytics engine rather than just looking at these as static models. So that's been the real goal here is to be able to do this virtual um, taphonomy to understand um, these deposits better. And we'll look at, uh, at another view of this in a second, and I'll provide some initial interpretations. Um, one of the other features in this is to is a photo drape feature. So this is um, the unmeshed point cloud. So we're not texturing a mesh, but rather overlaying the photos uh, that provide us another view into the bottom, right? So there are certain elements, skeletal elements, and also other uh, features that are not visible in the colored point cloud. Right, so maybe example, evidence of redox or some type of oxidation or organic <coughs> deposits, for example, that are visible only in that photo draping. So that's been an effective um, tool for us as well. I'll talk a little bit about the, um, the image acquisition strategy. This is 
uh, not your typical SFM type challenge. Um, and so we have the benefit of survey markers doing traditional Cartesian cartography to create um, a grid inside the cave and then move forward with, um, with uh, I should go back to the other one, move forward with, um, oh, that was interesting. I don't know what happened there. Let me uh, see if I can get this to play. Okay, very good. So um, the problem here is obviously it's completely dark. And as you'll see, we're, the, the lines, uh, the transects for the, for the image acquisition was done at constant depth, not constant altitude. So ideally, we would have taken a constant altitude approach, but then the divers on, on uh, closed circuit rebreathers would have been adding and subtracting gas from the BCDs. That releases gas to the surface, creates a percolation problem, all of that comes snowing down and, um, and yields, uh, well, impact to the site, but also affects um, the image quality. So the idea was to keep a constant depth rather than constant altitude, and that's why you get areas that are, um, we have much higher resolution and much more detail, and those where you're penetrating up to 10 meters of water, obviously you're dealing with the loss of light and the consequent loss of, of resolution and detail in deeper portions of the cave. And when you're doing SF underwater, as some of you probably have tried, you're dealing with issues of parallax and light attenuation. There's a number of challenges to getting good results um, but nevertheless, SFM is our um, primary uh, um, modeling, um, I should say, reality capture technique for a number of reasons. Now, you see some of the limitations. We don't have the walls and the ceiling. Um, it's far too time consuming. Uh, so the idea then is to complement this using a, a dynamically um, configured underwater laser scanner. If we can get that pulled together and raise <laughs> the requisite funding, um, then I think we're going to get good, uh, good geometry for the, for the walls and ceiling of the cave as well. So um, we'll do another fly through, or maybe not. Let's see if this one works. Um, I think it's angry at me. I think it froze. Um, okay, let's see if we can get this to play. Um, I wanted to show one thing on this. I don't know if anyone has some problem solving skills here on this particular laptop, but it is not playing. Um, Okay, well, we'll go back to that one later. So this is just showing some of the features uh, that Vid Petrovic, uh, the developer of the software, has built into VizCore, which is the um, visual analytics engine. So these are pre-annotated point, annotated points that were selected. You see the zebra, zebraing there, showing what's, what points are being, or what points that have already been annotated are being selected. We can have tools, or we can say, in this case, completing the marking or annotation of the zygomatic here, and then this will be an example of um, the tool missing, hitting some of the substrate, we can go back and erase that. But once we've completely marked all the points, then uh, you can select them and then remove them, uh, and then bring them into, uh, into an environment where you can do the, do the morphometrics. Um, so we're removing the, the, we have the smilet on there, we just removed the peccary. And then some very basic tools, I think Vid's going to show here, a hypothetical measurement uh, across the sagittal crest. Um, and you can see, we can evaluate that we have some occlusion issues. We didn't get good, uh, good coverage of the occipital, so maybe we want to do that in the lab or do that in the water. Um, but nevertheless, be able to get some fundamental measurements by taking this approach. And then um, what we can also do is very quickly, although we deal mostly with point data, we can very quickly mesh it maybe bring it into Sketchfab and, and share it, um, you know, get some comments back from other folks, um, I should say Sketchfab, and, uh, and then um, we can bring it back into, uh, into VizCore and then reinsert it back into the site. So, um, <clears throat> I wanted to see if I can, okay, here we go. Okay, let me see if I can get this one to play. Anyway, I'll have, to, I'll have to deal with that one later. So, um, and I talked about sort of this digital extraction reassertion. Um, with some of the specimens, they're very difficult to image uh, and get a comprehensive view in situ. Um, so uh, this is the, now back in the lab, um, the megalonychid uh, uh, mandible. Um, and what we're showing here is um, kind of a reverse of, of what we would ordinarily do. So this is now, digitally reinserted into the point cloud. You can see the mandible on the right of the ground sloth. Um, we could take it out. Um, and so we were able to get its uh, position through the initial imaging of the deposit, of course, taking it out of the cave and then doing um, in-lab uh, photogrammetry and then digitally reinserting it so we get um, the best possible model that we can reinsert into, um, into the, the point cloud of the site. 
So, um, and then now it's going to get reinserted. And you can tell that we have uh, a number of different resolutions here. So the areas of specific interest, um, we may acquire dozens to hundreds of images, creating very dense point clouds. Um, what I was going to show you with the other, other video is that um, is an example of, of sort of how that works, where we can um, you know, have some, some areas where you have maybe a meter and a half by two meters, 700 million points, a very dense point cloud using a different image acquisition strategy. Um, we'll be able to nest that inside uh, the more sparse point data that we have for the cave itself. Um, so some of these specimens have become topside, do CT scanning x-ray, um, also structured light scanning, RTI, a number of other techniques. And then we can take those specimens and reinsert them or, or basically toggle on and off layers within the point cloud giving us different views of the same specimen. Um, so this is a, two examples. One of um, the ability to, uh, okay, before I showed the photo draping of the point data, now what we're doing is bringing up or calling up selecting the point and bringing up all of the JPEGs that are associated with creating geometry. So, um, and this gives, this lets, allows us to evaluate, evaluate the quality of, of the photogrammetry. Um, maybe look at some of those images where we might be able to detect other scale elements not visible in the point cloud. Um, so being able to very rapidly call that up in a web browser. So if we don't have all those thousands of photos or tens of thousands of photos local, um, then we can do that via the web and do a very rapid evaluation of all the imagery used to create the, the, the geometry. Um, and then we'll see a transition here where we'll move out of the photograph and back into the point cloud. So right about here. There we go. And um, this is just another example. This particular scapula was um, scanned by Blaine and, and his students recently using the Artec scanner. And so now we've just reinserted that as a, as a layer. We can, we can turn it on and off. We can use the photogrammetric model. We can use this, this structured light model. Um, but the idea is that it becomes, uh, it provides this sort of virtual access um, that we, we consider so critical um, to really understanding what's going on on the site. So um, what this also now enables us to do is, um, uh, bone recovery planning, right? So uh, it's, it's not as easy sometimes just to, to <laughs> pull the bones off the bottom of the cave. Um, this, uh, um, some of them obviously are quite large, the sloth and the, and the gompothier, for example. Um, there's obviously special care required. So by working with those digital surrogates, we can do the recovery planning, and we can also create topside um, custom cases for those bones for the recovery. Um, by just 3D printing them from, from the model. So you can see a little bit of that going on here. There's Naya's cranium on the right, and, um, and then some of the, um, uh, and her sacrum and, and uh, the femur there on the left. And um, so one of the other things too is condition assessment. Uh, so if, you know, sometimes the point cloud, the colored points are a bit noisy, we can turn those off and just look at the, um, the geometry. And in this case, fractures um, become, in the bone become a little bit more apparent. Uh, we get better results here with respect to normals with photogrammetry over laser scanning. Um, you know, each of these different uh, uh, reality capture techniques having their own value. So again, we're looking here at point data, but um, it's you now a selected smile on peccary um, uh, that you can notice things sometimes in the geometry that you don't notice in the color points and vice versa. So uh, we do quite a bit of this analysis on campus in uh, 3D um, immersive uh, sort of big VR environments. So we're able to collaboratively work together. We bring in the paleontologists, the archaeologists, geologists, hydrogeochemists, um, all together in this environment to not, you know, to not put on a, a, a head-mounted display, but rather stand around these 3D data with glasses on and have a conversation. Um, and it's those conversations that really lead to discoveries in the data, and they, um, they allow for the exchange of ideas that um, have really benefited us in terms of better understanding the site. And so um, this is another one of our immersive environments on campus. This one's a sun cave, just one online. So those are all passive 3D displays, um, ultra high definition that um, allow us to virtually access the cave. So we think of our underwater cave explorers as our astronauts. Um, we're back at mission control, and we want to have as clear a picture of what they're seeing as possible. And one thing I will mention really quickly, because we didn't see it in the other video, but um, I was going to show you sort of the two parts of Naya's um, skeleton the lower half of her skeleton relatively well articulated in one portion of the cave, and the upper half of her skeleton relatively well articulated in another portion of the cave. And what appears to have happened by looking at trauma on her bones that are consistent with a high fall into a very shallow pool of water, 
um, that she, uh, and unlike, not unlike other organisms in the cave, were positively buoyant, gases expand, they become, as they decompose, become positively buoyant, and then those gases escape, they become neutrally buoyant. They start to break apart, right? And I mean, the earlier presentation by um, Sarah, Sarah and Haley, and I'm sure they can, I'd love to be able to sort of talk offline about some of these different deposits, but some very interesting things going on, but it appears that the upper half of her decomposing corpse got hooked on um, some of the uh, some of the Rillicarin, and she came apart at the base of her torso, and that lower part stayed articulated because of um, of the flesh, etc. And she settled off in two different portions. What we also see is a number of the animals winding up on the rim of the cave, on like a ring, like a bathtub ring of bones, and it's because they were ultimately positively buoyant. And when there's disturbances in the water, they float to the edge where they get hung up and then decompose. So we see the draping of those bones as a result of them becoming skeletonized as they're cascading down a, a, a wall with significant rugosity. So we're, we're trying to better understand that. So if we just looked at the bones and didn't look at the substrate, we wouldn't understand that. But if we look at the substrate with the bones, we can see how that's influencing um, how those bones move as those, um, as those uh, um, animals be, uh, become skeletonized. So um, sorry for that one video not working. Um, I could probably bring it up a little bit later. Uh, I should mention that this project's ongoing. We just wrapped up a field season last week, and um, I am happy to take any questions. Thank you.